Welcome to the Viva Vegan Podcast with me, Faye. And me, Lex. So welcome to the podcast today, Moby, and thank you for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. So for those of you listening, I'm sure you're already well aware of who Moby is, uh, whether that's through his prolific catalogue of music or through his tireless advocating for veganism and animal rights, all of which we'll touch on over the next 30 minutes or so. But Moby, I would love for you to just take us back to the kind of the beginning and tell us a little bit about your childhood and how your compassion for animals was founded. Well, I had, uh, on one hand, a very standard childhood. I mean, I grew up very, very poor. You know, my mom and I were on food stamps and welfare until I was around 18. Um, But I grew up with what I've come to think of as this overarching paradox in human culture, which is the baffling and inexplicable paradox of loving animals and being horrified by animal suffering while also paying for animal suffering and contributing to animal suffering. Um, and I, that's how I grew up. So I, when I was a child, we had so many rescued animals. We had rescued dogs. We had rescued lab rats. We had rescued guinea pigs, hamsters, mice, <laughs> lizards, everything. And I loved our rescued animals so much, more than any human I knew. But I also loved going to Burger King and I loved pepperoni pizza and I, you know, I loved American terrible meat based junk food. And then when I was around 19 years old, um, I had an epiphany and I realized I was I was petting a rescue cat of ours. And I suddenly realized like this rescue cat, his name was Tucker, like he has such a rich emotional life and he doesn't want to suffer. He wants to be happy. He wants to be at peace. And I realized that was true for every animal, for every sentient being. You know, Tucker had two eyes and a central nervous system and every sentient being, well, I mean, some have more than two eyes, but like every sentient being wants to simply be left alone to live their own life according to their own will. And so that was 1984, so I went, I became a vegetarian in 1984. And then a few years later in 1987, became a vegan. So it's been now 30, I've been a vegan now for 35 years. Wow. And I'm guessing for you to see the sort of shift in landscapes been kind of huge in that time as well. But it's weird that we're still trying to explain that animals are sentient beings <laughs> in all of that time that you've been vegan and vegetarian. How's it been for you? Do, you? do you remember what it was like when you first made that decision when you were younger? Yeah. And, you know, what's what's interesting, and I'm sure that you've experienced this, I've experienced it countless times, anyone listening has experienced this, where, like, once we realize that it is egregiously hypocritical and inconsistent to be troubled by animal suffering while also causing animal suffering, you know, to be deeply disturbed by animal cruelty while also paying people to be cruel to animals. Like once we realize this, we sort of think, oh, once I get this message to people, they will agree and they will change their behavior. And what's fascinating and horrifying is everyone already agrees with us, you know, except for the few psychopaths, like everyone agrees with what we're saying. They're just completely unwilling to change their behavior. And the bafflement around that, like, I've done I've done talks where you ask an, an auditorium full of people, you can say like, okay, hands up, who here is disturbed by animal suffering? Everyone raise their hand. Continue, you say, who here would never knowingly hurt an animal? Everyone keeps their hands up. Next question, who here is a vegan? Everyone puts their hands down. And you're like, what? But you do understand that the food you're putting into your body is the product of unspeakably horrifying suffering and misery. And it's the least ethical thing that human beings have ever produced. And people are horrified by it, but they keep paying for it. So it's very, it's, you know, for 35 years, I've been completely baffled by that. I understand entirely. One thing that I really admired about you was when and this is something that I do admire about you in general, is that you will come out and just say things as they are in a compassionate and truthful way. And there's been times where you've been 
kind of vilified for that. I mean, one thing I admired was when you came out on Twitter and tweeted, you know, a reminder in a vegan world, there would be no pandemics, you know, that the pandemics are a zoon- that they're zoonotic in origin, hashtag vegan for life. We have the science behind this and yet it's not being covered. And it's just, it's such a, an important message, but, and I understand the battle because that's what we do every day. You know, we're trying to refute these claims yeah. and belief systems that people have so embedded. What was so interesting about that in particular, because I'm no, I'm no longer on Twitter because it has just become a cesspool of like right-wing lunacy. But that one in particular was so surprising to me because it's the, I believe it's the only time one of my social media posts was flagged and suppressed. And I, I never read comments, but someone sent me some, you know, like some people who had commented and they were like, they're like a vegan, you know, a vegan diet is not going to prevent pandemics. And I was like, oh, people don't understand that veganism, it's food, but it's also an ethos. Like, I think people thought that, you know, like by eating soybeans, we were going to prevent a pandemic. I was like, that's not what I'm saying. I mean, yeah, by all means, eat soybeans. They're they're very good for you. But to state the obvious, and I, I apologize because you clearly already know what I was saying was a vegan world is a world where animals are no longer used by and for humans. You know, we no longer encroach upon their habitat. And that's the origin of these zoonotic diseases. And again, every every pandemic is zoonotic. It's just there's no exception down to the common cold. Like every every viral pandemic that has ever existed is zoonotic in origin which by definition means in a vegan world, there'd be no more viral pandemics. Like it's, it's just how things work, unless they're manufactured. Absolutely agree. And funnily enough, even in the rebuttals, the press, despite not wanting to, they, they basically said that, yes, many pandemics and epidemics are zoonotic in, orig- in, in origin. That's it. You know, the, these are diseases that are transferred from, hu- from animals to human, but they're still just trying to pick at it in any way. But what you say is completely accurate. Well, it's also, I mean, like, and this is, I mean, as you know, (laughs) part of being an animal rights activist, part of being a vegan is just being so confused by our fellow humans. Because, you know, humans claim to care about climate change, but they're unwilling to look at the role of animal agriculture, which is the third leading cause of climate change. You know, people talk about this, how out of control healthcare costs are. I'm like, yeah, Harvard Medical said that roughly 80% of healthcare costs are related to diet and lifestyle. And when they say diet and lifestyle, sure, that's sugar, but it's mainly, you know, that fast food processed American diet. You know, the World Health Organization classed processed meats as a class one carcinogen in the same category as cigarettes, but yet they're served in every school on the planet. Like it's, it's kind of like giving cigarettes to school kids. So this unwillingness that among humans to basically look at science, to look at facts, to look at evidence and then change as a result, like that it's so, it's so mind boggling. And I know, I I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it really is just like this constant, like, how many times a day do we read articles about health or climate change or pandemics? And we're like, yeah, there's a solution. Stop (laughs) subsidizing animal products. True. And that's the problem. They're so heavily subsidized and everything is stacked in their favor, as you know, follow the money trail back and see who benefits from it. But it is Mm -hmm. a case of people having to think for themselves and investigate things for themselves. And the literature is there. It's there in masses, but it's a few pages into Google before you'll see it. And it's a, it's a strange world we're living in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, if I'm being completely honest, as time has passed, I've just become much more of a misanthrope, you know? Like, it's really, uh, I mean, I find myself sort of being an anti-human, which is ironic because I'm human, <laughs> but, like, it's hard to make an objective case that humans are good for this planet. You know, one could make a very compelling, rational, empirically supported case that a world without humans would be a considerably better world than the world that we've created completely 
No, I don't want to sound too depressed either, but I completely agree with that. Yeah. It just takes me back to the Matrix in 1999, where he talks about humans being the disease that consumes and then moves on. And, and we just keep doing that across the planet. Well, but... it, it's funny because that's a recurring narrative trope in so many movies and so many TV shows where like the villain says, but humanity is a plague. Humanity is a scourge, like even in Wonder Woman. And, and you're like, yeah. So, okay, um, they're right. And it's just so odd that that's this recurring thing that somehow the villains are the ones saying humanity is the problem. I'm like, well, they're not villains. They're just looking at the evidence. Mm -hmm. It's true. And so, you know, we'll, we'll use that as a segue to talk a little bit now about the fact that you've just premiered a punk rock vegan movie at Slam Dance Festival. Now, you've worked in film before. I mean, one of my personal favorites was your role back in 2009 in, in a film called Suck. <laughs> I'm not sure if our listeners have seen this film. It was a bit of a cult vampire comedy horror film. And you actually play the part of Beef Bellows, who was a, a frontman of a fictional punk band called the Secretaries of Steak. And the Secretaries fans show their appreciation by hurling pieces of meat at you, obviously fake meat. But that was that looked like quite a bit of fun to be part of. It was so ridiculous. I mean, I got involved <laughs> because a friend of mine was helping to produce it. And also there were all these surprising people like Malcolm McDowell from Clockwork Orange was in it and Henry Rollins and Iggy Pop, you know, this really odd group of people. And I was like, you know what? Sure, I'll be in this movie. And also I did think, okay, by being this ridiculous character who gets fake and in the movie it looks like real meat but the truth is just sponges soaked in corn syrup um i was like maybe somehow this will remind people that like meat is disgusting like like when you see someone being covered in blood and meat maybe the audience might be like oh yeah that is that is disgusting so i mean i have no interest in being an actor um and i don't think anyone apart from you and possibly the people who made the movie have actually seen that movie i don't i, I almost can't recommend it cuz it's so you know such a, it's such a b minus movie but it it, I like it, it. it it isn't without its charms yeah. but it's definitely uh it, it it shouldn't be on the top of anyone's list of films to come watch <laughs> okay fair enough i mean i enjoyed it i really did it, yeah alice cooper as well another cameo that was yeah, it was quite bizarre it. wasn't it it sure was. Uh, just like more and more people just kept sort of showing up. But yeah, sorry, I, I digress on that. Punk rock vegan mo movie. That's your first directional debut. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I've made, I've obviously, I've directed music videos. I've made little short films. But what happened was a few years ago, I was talking to some people in the animal rights movement. And I was bringing up the fact that, you know, a lot of the original animal rights activists were people in punk rock bands, you know, UK bands like Crass, even Captain Sensible from The Damned, X-Ray Specs, and obviously American bands like Youth of Today, Gorilla Biscuits, cro on and on. And I realized almost no one was aware of this fact. Like people assumed that punk rock was loud, violent anarchy. And I was like, oh, actually... No, it was incredibly principled. You know, some of the lyrics are some of the most principled lyrics that have ever been written because I grew up with that world. And so I made this documentary to both sort of look at this interesting history of punk rock and animal rights, but also, I mean, even more important than that is my goal with everything I do is how can I use whatever resources I have, whatever access to platforms I have to try and move the needle away from the current system. And part of that is being involved in politics. Part of that is traditional philanthropy. Um, but a big part of that is using creativity. You know, how can I use my whatever limited creative resources I have to try and, you know, address this issue in a way that will actually reach people who might not, not otherwise be reached. And so with the movie, we're actually... It's um it's coming out on Monday Monday or Tuesday, uh, the beginning of February, and we're giving it away. Like the I've had some offers from streaming services, but I don't want anyone to have to pay for this. So it's only going to be available on on platforms where people don't have to pay. That's brilliant. It's. It's great that you're doing that. And it's not the first time. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about your philanthropy actually towards uh, veganism and animal rights in a little bit. But 
just circling back in the documentary, I, 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 I'm really excited to kind of see it. I saw the trailer, and it is that inescapable that the kind of alternative scene in punk and. You know, you, you've interviewed some incredible names on there. You've got like Fugazi, Ian McKay and Amy Lee from Evan and Essence, Dave Navarro. I, I didn't even know he was vegan. Uh, yeah, like you say, Captain Sensible, Rise Against. How was this like a complete pa passion project for you? And how did you kind of reach out to those people and how did it come to be? Well, in some cases, uh, like, for example, the band Youth of Today, Ray and Purcell, like I've known them since 1982. And a lot of the people in the movie are animal rights activists, like, you know, Tony from No Doubt, Doyle from The Misfits, Rob Zombie. And so basically I would go to animal rights events, see them there and ask if I could interview them. Um, and then in other cases, like, for example, Steve Ignorant from Crass, who's really one of the absolute originators of punk rock and animal rights. I just kept asking everyone I knew. I was like, does anyone know Steve ignorant does anyone have an email address or some contact form and it's just weeks and weeks and months and months of trying to chase some of these people down and eventually getting through them and they were very gracious and incredibly receptive to talking about this excellent and yeah it's it's amazing so the, I mean the history between animal activism and punk rock is astounding and I really don't know of any other musical genres really where despite that aggression, it actually does preach so much compassion. I grew up with all that music as well, and it does really shape the way that you challenge authority and see the world, and you make that connection between what you're being told and what's actually correct. Uh, you start to question it, I think, from quite a young age uh, with exposure to that music. I mean, that's, that is, at least from my perspective, I mean, there is a tradition of punk rock that is just ridiculousness, um, <laughs> and, you know, but... There's also the tradition with the underlying ethos of very rational, principled questioning of everything around you, you know, questioning, I mean, the most obvious of questioning music, questioning fashion, questioning social mores, but it's, it just naturally leads to like questioning food systems. And it's really hard. And I, I think this is, it's a hard thing for us to talk about openly but like being within the sort of progressive left-wing community and the fact that a majority of people in the progressive left-wing community who care about workers rights who care about the environment who care about climate change who care about deforestation they keep eating meat and dairy you know like aoc you know one of the you know luminaries of the progressive movement in the united states like eats hamburgers and cheeseburgers and i'm like okay so that's kind of like being a lung cancer activist who smokes cigarettes publicly like it's so hard and challenging and baffling to be confronted with climate activists who eat meat and dairy you know with people who care about workers rights who eat meat and dairy with people who care about animals who eat meat and dairy so the that punk rock ethos of like you question everything you apply rational ethical criteria to everything and if it doesn't conform to rational ethical criteria you change your behavior and it's just again we were talking about this earlier but it's so confusing and heartbreaking that so many people are simply unwilling to change their behavior like it's a uh, yeah, like I said, I'm kind of, there's a part of me that's sort of like rooting for a world without people. <laughs> I know, but don't get too misanthropic yet. I mean, one good thing is that there is a rise. In the UK, for example, veganism is rising exponentially. And it's quite funny for us as a charity because we were laughing at some of the the kind of counteraction to that. You know, we're getting a lot of uh, farmers and there's a lot of adverts and things trying to, you know, talk about... Oh, how meat and dairy is the best source of b12 for you i mean they don't list the percentage that you receive from it you know within meat because it's a byproduct as we know but there's a mm -hmm. real there's a real pushback now and that makes me think oh actually they are running scared a little bit and it's supply and demand so you know the fact that burger king and things are bringing out plant-based burgers says a lot so i understand the frustration as it, as annoying as it is there is a shift i think it's rippling and especially in the uk i know it's still America is huge, you know, and it's it's going to take a long time to change there. But even we're seeing shifts over here. 
Oh yeah, I mean the UK, based on what I can see, it is it is act you know completely ground zero for the sort of like the vegan upswell. Um, I mean, obviously, animal rights and veganism they're spreading everywhere, even in very unexpected places like Russia or South Korea. You know, places you wouldn't necessarily expect to be vegan animal rights oriented, but they are. But like the UK is definitely the center for it. And I think, I don't know which came first, but I started noticing maybe about five or six years ago is very, you know, mainstream media in the UK started reporting, you know, whether it's BBC, whether it's the Guardian, the Independent, like they started writing about the role of animal agriculture and climate change. They started, you know, like it was a much more open approach that the media had towards looking at the consequences of animal agriculture and American media won't touch it. Mm. <laughs> I Maybe it's because of the advertisers, maybe it's because of the subscribers, but like it's so uncommon for American media, even progressive, as we mentioned, progressive American media won't look at the role of animal agriculture in health workers' rights, climate, deforestation, and also specifically animal rights. So, yeah, the UK is definitely at the forefront more so than, and, and in a very meaningful institutional way. So it's, uh, yeah, it's really inspiring watching what's going on. Yeah, it's a strange one because it feels, sometimes it feels like the, the old systems are about to collapse. It's almost like a death rattle before that happens. I mean, you've probably heard about our rotating door of, prime ministers and Brexit and everything like this it feels very it feels like things are being stripped away a lot and there's like more truths emerging in the at least in the UK it's very it's an interesting time right now mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah absolutely and there's always been I mean the UK is such a, a fascinating place and forgive me for saying the obvious but there is a cohesion to it because it's geographically it's quite big, but it's compared to some other countries, relatively small. And because of the media cohesion has also made it a much more responsive country. You know, the United States never had that, has never had that cohesion, either geographic or culturally. And the UK, I mean, like the classic example is like, and granted, this is less so the case now, but like Radio 1, it used to be like, oh, you had a song on Radio 1 and you played it on top of the pops. Instantly, you have a number one song like that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And that and I would also say just that the media in the UK, which at times, of course, is problematic as all media can be. But like there is a sort of erudition and principled aspect to British media, to media in the UK that doesn't exist in most other places. That's so true. it's it, it's very and, and that's been the case for you know a long time. And when you're in the UK, you might not even necessarily be aware of it compared and contrasted to the rest of the world. But the rest of the world is the media landscape is a lot more, you know, a lot more chaotic for lack of a, to, to be diplomatic. You know, that that makes sense. We still have key journalists that we know we can try and land an investigation with because they're sympathetic press yeah and it, it makes a huge difference whereas yeah i i get what you're saying that would be very very difficult in other parts of the world so i want to just talk a little bit more around your real kind of love of veganism i'm not sure how many people are aware of this but you've given a lot of your proceeds away um over the years from your music your cookbook you know, your vegan bistro, Little Pine, as, as well as through donations as well. And you, you funded countless charities and animal rescue charities, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Um, and they're a group of medical professionals who advocate for plant-based living. But when was it that you started to do this? And what was, you know, what was it the driving force for you to do this? Well, I've mentioned, so I've been a vegan now for 35 years. And I I guess for a long time, I mean, when I when I became a vegan, I was squatting in an abandoned factory. So I didn't have I barely had the ability to feed myself, let alone help other organizations. But as I started having a degree of commercial success, I just I don't know, maybe it's because I was raised by hippies or maybe because I was raised in the punk rock world. Uh, but I just it just made so much sense to me to try and like use the platform that I had to draw attention to issues of animal rights and veganism, but also to help, you know, give whatever resources I had to these organizations. And as time has passed, I've just, my, my commitment to that just keeps growing. I guess 
on a slightly more esoteric spiritual note, um, and it's a good name drop, um, I was talking to the Dalai Lama about wow. 15 years ago. And the Dalai Lama said something that annoyed me so much. It's one of the only times you can ever have someone say that they were annoyed by the Dalai Lama. <laughs> is He was basically saying that the key to happiness is service. And keep in mind, like, I'm not a I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not an anything. I'm a vegan. That's it. You know, that, that's my, if I had like, I, 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 my religion is doing what I can to help animals. But he said that the key to happiness is being of service and not being selfish. And I was so annoyed by that because I wanted to be selfish. You know, I wanted to be of service, but more importantly, I wanted to be hedonistic and selfish. And then time passed. I ended up getting sober about 12 or 13 years ago and i slowly realized like oh he was right like the selfishness paradoxically doesn't create happiness i mean if it did donald trump and kanye and elon musk would be the happiest people on the planet and they're all i can say from experience miserable you know like mm. so the more the more we pursue hedonism the more we pursue selfishness and I can say this from experience on my own and watching other people, the less happy we are. And mm -hmm. being of service, like I, you know, I follow some sort of gratuitous social media accounts just to see what they're doing. And like that, that vapid selfishness that is so common in our culture, I almost feel sorry for people that they mm -hmm. don't have a cause or principles outside of themselves that are more important to them than their own lives. Like I would say like that veganism and commitment to animal rights for me, it's like it actually is the answer to a lot of other almost psychological questions. And what I mean by that is I don't know if you've had this experience or anyone listening has had this experience, but like if I start to get depressed, if I start to feel sorry for myself, if I start thinking like, oh, I wish I had blank, all I have to do is immediately say, nope, the only thing that matters is working on behalf of animal rights and my depression goes away, my selfishness goes away because I'm like, yep, none of my concerns matter in the face of one trillion animals being killed by and for humans every year. It's brilliant. It's a bigger cause. And, you know, when you get if you I don't know for people with anxiety, if you ever one of the things I used to do was just zoom out, zoom out, zoom out to take a kind of bigger view of the world and then go into the universe. And then you realize how small it is. So when you're working for a bigger cause, it, it helps. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, but then Elon Musk probably does something like that and thinks I will own this moon. I will take ownership of the universe. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because Elon and I used to be friends oh. and I didn't. When we were friends, I didn't really understand. I don't know if this, I mean, this is a while ago, and I don't know if he's become more of a right-wing lunatic, but when we were friends, I wasn't aware that he was this sociopathic right-wing libertarian lunatic. Like, it's it's been a really depressing awakening because I had sort of, like many people, seen him as being like, a leading light like he was you know helping to build electric cars he was going to help us potentially go to mars i was always frustrated that he wasn't vegan i was like you care about climate change but you're not vegan like but i just assumed he would get there and clearly that's not in the cards you've also just released a new album this year which is called ambient 23 um and it's an excellent it's it's very brian eno in scope uh can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about where the idea for this album came from and is ambient like ambient music something you've been working on for a while i mean i know you you like all kinds of music but yeah i mean i was first exposed to ambient music in the 70s when i bought my first david bowie record which had you know um heroes where the b-side of the album is all ambient music and i just thought that was so interesting this idea of utilitarian music that's just designed to create landscapes it's designed to you know it's almost like musical architecture and of course i mean the course of my life i've played classical music and dance music and punk rock and so many different types of music but ambient music is the music that i largely make for myself and 
what I started doing a while ago was taking the ambient music that I was making for myself and giving it away in the hope that it would reach people and make them less anxious or give them some sort of respite from chaos. Uh, so that's why I like, I don't like charging for things generally, you know, as I mentioned, the, the punk rock vegan movie, we're giving it away for free, but with ambient music, like I would hate the idea of someone paying for it. Like I want, you know, if people need it, hopefully they can access it for free. No, that's, I mean, that's beautiful. And it does, that kind of music helps with anxiety. I don't think there's anything more frustrating than when you're listening to a meditation, you know, on YouTube or something, and suddenly right in the center of it, you'll get an advert. It's like nonstop advertising. So it's Yeah, that is definitely like, um, <laughs> not, it doesn't, I mean, I guess you could develop phenomenal meditation skills and transcend the irritation and reprocess the stimuli but like I'm not at that level <laughs> that's fair that's I mean that's brilliant I mean thank you very much we're actually running out of time now but I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and talking to us I mean you've been one of the biggest advocates for kind of animal rights for such a long time and it's great that we can actually have the conversations with you to kind of reach more listeners because it obviously helps raise the profile of what we do as well as a as a vegan charity to reach more and more people. Mm -hmm. So we just want to say thank you very much for coming on and talking to us today. Oh, it's 100% my pleasure because, I mean, also every other activist in the world inspires me. Like I try to follow everyone on social media and like any animal rights activist, even if they're, you know, maybe approaching at times, as we've seen, you know, animal rights activism can be inelegant and sometimes a little maybe ineffective, but nonetheless, I applaud everyone who's working to basically create a world wherein animals are not used by and for humans, that they're allowed to live their own lives according to their own will. And lastly, the only thing I'll say that I try to remind activists about is, one, our activism should serve animals, and two, there really isn't any room for infighting among activists. Like, even if we disagree with each other, we're not the enemy. Like, the enemy is so clear, and it other activists are never the enemy, even if we disagree with them pretty vehemently. That's a very, very good point, because sometimes, uh, and it comes, I think it comes from a good place, I think it comes from passion, but there is a lot of kind of fighting within these movements at yeah. times. Um, and I get it. Yep. It's because people are really fueled and really care. And but it is true that we are actually we, we're needed to unite to you know in order to for real change to happen. Yeah, focus on the real enemy. Like a few years ago, I was speaking at a direct action everywhere conference, and I mentioned this. And I sort of because obviously direct action everywhere is quite young and very sort of got that punk rock ethos. And I said, I'm looking out at this audience of a few hundred people. And I said, and I guarantee you, I've been vegan longer than anyone here. And I'm not bragging. What I'm saying is I don't judge you, but every single person here at some point was eating Burger King while I was vegan. And I'm not judging you. So you have to give people the non-judgmental space in which to change, in which to evolve. And um, I think activists should ideally remember that even when we're frustrated and upset. Very wise words. Well, thank you so much for coming on tonight, Moby. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you for all that you do. And um, yeah, hopefully at some point <laughs> we can either live in a world where animals are allowed to live their own lives or in a world without humans, um, which clearly <laughs> if it's a world without humans, we won't be able to acknowledge to each other that that's the world we're living in. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Take care. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So Lex, what did you think of Moby then? I actually really enjoyed that interview because I've never been really sure. I mean, I don't particularly like Moby's music, but I've always known him more for being into punk rock than into the kind of dance scene. And, you know, it's not like I would sit down and listen to a Moby record, but he's actually a really right on guy. And I was really impressed with just his attitude towards the whole vegan movement and being an animal rights activist and not being smug about the fact he's been vegan for such a long time, you know, like he was saying with the Direct Action Everywhere conference he went to. It was just cool for him to be like, you don't need to be young, angry vegans thinking that you know best and be self-righteous because 
you know, the, the vast majority of vegans have eaten meat at some point, And then we have this like epiphany one day and it stops. And I don't think we can suddenly just because we've got there, we shouldn't be judging other people for not being there. So I thought it was really cool of him to say that. And he's got such a wealth of life experience as well. I mean, meeting the Dalai Lama and then annoying him, feeling quite annoyed by um, what he told him, I thought was quite interesting. Absolutely. You wouldn't thought the Dalai Lama could annoy anybody. But, <laughs> you know, and I think that's something that was really, it came across a lot in the interview that he's he's obviously in all of this for the right reasons. And it's why he's been vegan for such a long time, because he has that commitment to animal rights and the core vegan message that, nothing like nothing matters other than total animal liberation like nothing else is acceptable and you know the the big thing I think for a lot of people and certainly for me like I grew up listening to a lot of those bands Ian McKay was like a big influence on me Capo Porcel I've been vegan straight edge for like the last 20 years and so it's just I don't know I've got to that point where like I don't talk about being well I talk about being vegan every day (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't, you should be <laughs> that's your job <laughs> but I don't talk about being straight edge every day because I think it's still seen as a bit culty <laughs> maybe <laughs> people, people like that don't know just don't know and I just, so like I'm more often than not now would say oh I don't drink or and that'd be yeah, like you do that actually I do I never like I don't just say oh, I'm straight edge because people you have to then like explain <laughs> <laughs> what it is and it does sound really culty but essentially I mean it just came out of me listening to those bands growing up and having this mantra of being animal friendly anti-fascist gay positive pro-feminist these are the core things that have stuck with me since like being a teenage kid wearing like an extra large no effects hoodie with the biggest jeans on the planet that actually every time my feet would get caught in them and fall over and like almost break my neck. But that's what yeah. we used to do. We used to wear these it really is. big, big clothes and we used to listen to punk rock and it taught us how to be decent human beings. And it was loud and fast and angry music, but lyrically they were so incredibly political and had such a massive influence on me, my ethics, my lifestyle, my attitude, the way I treat other people, the whole idea of collective liberation. So it's just really nice to get that from Moby as well, like listening to him talk about the influences on him. And I always find when you talk to vegans, they'll always, you know, they, they'll they potentially a lot of the time talk about the one animal that impact them, mm. this special relationship that they had with an animal. And I don't think I've ever really had that. Like I had a dog when we were a kid and like lots of fish when I was a kid. But, you know, I don't think, I don't think I have that special connection to what yeah, I like. Yeah. I went off to save whales, but like, I don't think I've got that one connection with a special animal. And so I, and, and that's the thing for me, it was, it was punk that influenced me on that level to become vegan and to become an all right human being. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I agree with you entirely. And I, I mean, I couldn't stand no effects. I mean, Fat Mike what? to me is just, oh, I cannot stand him and I cannot stand that music. And I will go on record and say that. <laughs> cannot stand them. However, <laughs> all the other bands, yes, that you mentioned, you know, like, I think he's talked about Gorilla Biscuit as well and like Walter Schreifels and I introduced him to Weatherspoon so I did not do a good thing there. <laughs> and he's obviously got Refused in the documentary, yeah. he's got Rise Against, he's got Evanescence, he's got Jane's Addiction, he's got Minor Threat, like it's just Youth of Today, there's so, so many bands that it, I just cannot wait to watch this documentary, I think it's going to be brilliant. Agreed. And going back to your point on the straight edge as well, I mean, he didn't say that necessarily, but he did say he'd been sober, I think, for something like 12 years now. Yeah. And I really like that about him because he came across as so non-preachy. But, you know, I like that he he kind of said that because I feel like, you know, in 1999, when Play came out, everybody knew the songs, you know, whether you liked them or not, you couldn't escape them. Personally, mm. I loved the miserable ones, but the minute he got a bit happy, I was like, done. But the, the video with um, Christina Ricci as well. That was really good. But anyway, he would have fallen into all the pitfalls and trappings that comes with that huge like level of success overnight. Yeah. So, you know, and he has spoken in other interviews about that. So for him to then go through all of that, figure his way out of it, go through it, 
I'm happy to hear what he has to say because he's somebody who's gone through and experienced things in life and his core mm-hmm. values have remained the same, but he's also got all these other experiences and people like that, I personally would rather listen to them, you know, like at all times. And I think it's really, it comes across as much more genuine with him, whereas with other people, like say Russell Brand, he's not for me at all. I just, his ego for me, I just find vile and it's completely contrasting with everything he's claiming to be, which is some nonsense spiritual leader now. Please, if you're taking advice for him, there's something very wrong with you. You always seem to go off on a rant about someone and I was so proud of you for holding your tongue about Elon Musk (laughs) because I could could feel the rage coming through. Oh, I did so well, didn't I? I did so well but I liked Moby and I thought you know what I like the way he's just kind of come around and he's got a kind of um there's a kind of like sense of humor as well with him which is really nice yeah and I am gonna I'm gonna start creating like a Faye bingo card because <laughs> they're mo- I honestly lost count of the amount of interviews you've done where you've got to mention the matrix too <laughs> ah! well it's one of my favorite films like did I ever mention that yes you have mentioned it quite a few times so I thought I that was it. brilliant that it came through and it got me thinking when he mentioned Henry Rollins as well, because I actually mm. went to see Henry Rollins do a spoken word thing when, like, Sons of Anarchy, when it was it, like, its peak, mm. peak popularity, uh, one of the best shows ever. And I just remember, like, Henry Rollins was just absolutely brilliant. But the one take home I had from that was the fact that I think he spoke for about three hours straight and didn't have a single sip of water. And I was like, <laughs> how, how can you <laughs> had like just keep talking and talking and talking for all those hours and not take a single sip of water? Can't remember anything about what he said. Nothing. I just remember Sons of Anarchy and the fact that he didn't drink any water. Yeah, I mean Henry Rollins, he is he's just he's a mouthpiece, isn't he? he? Is. he just goes and goes and goes and goes in everything he does, and I'm just like, My lord. Another kind of interesting angle that you had in that conversation with Moby was this whole thing about infighting because we just can't seem to get away from it and I remember like even being with Sea Shepherd we just pulled into one of the docks in the Netherlands with the Ocean Warrior and we pulled up next to a Greenpeace vessel and I was just so excited because like oh my god I've never seen a Greenpeace ship before let's go let's go and have a tour this is going to be amazing but they were so opposed to us being there not necessarily the crew individually but it was like the whole vibe from the kind of senior officers on board just did not want to talk to Sea Shepherd. And then Mm. I went off on one of the West Africa campaigns because I ended up befriending one of the crew. He was super nice. And I ended up in West Africa. And when you are on a ship, you have these automatic identification systems called AIS. And you can basically see other vessels in the area. And I saw the Greenpeace ship coming through like past Sierra Leone. So I messaged my friend. I was like, oh my God, are you on the ship? Like you're going to pass right by us. And he's like, oh my God, yeah, I'm on the ship. What are you doing? I was like, what are you doing? And it was just like, so the public perception of Sea Shepherd and Greenpeace was just all this infighting and just hating each other. But when it just came down to the people, it was just like, no, we're actually all pretty right on activists that are just trying to do the right thing. But then, like, people being people, of course there's going to be fighting. between. I mean, we we just cannot (laughs) stand to get along most of the time. And I guess everybody's a little misanthropic, aren't they? I was going to say, why is this suddenly just headed into, like, misanthropy again? Bloody hell, I can never say that word. But that's my point, because it's just like, we're all trying to get along, but then sometimes we just don't. (laughs) And then it leads to these infights, and then that impacts, like, maybe the way that we do activism, and, you know, it can... It just becomes, like, these issues that shouldn't be an issue because the most important thing is making a difference for animals. And if we're too busy fighting each other... How can we fight the rest of them that are yeah. inflicting this suffering and exploitation? And it, it, it just becomes overwhelming. It does. And it plays right into the hands of what the media are creating anyway, which is saying, you know, left loonies, vegans, judgmental. And you're like, yeah, we know this is nonsense. And then you see some of the comment section and you're like, oh, for heaven's sakes, just stop it. Just get along. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But, and that's the thing, in the animal rights movement, I think it's important to have people around you that can say, 
you just need to check yourself. Like if I was being outrageous, you would say to me, like, stop being outrageous. Like just rein it in. <laughs> and then I'll be like, oh. yeah. Uh, I, I, I probably, often do. <laughs> I'll probably be angry for a couple of minutes and be like, no, no, you're wrong, you're wrong. But eventually I will come round to, yeah, I've probably overreacted. Yeah. <laughs> but I just think, you, you do. <laughs> You always make me a cup of coffee after. <laughs> like if more people could just like reflect on their own behaviours as well, maybe maybe the world could be a much better place and we wouldn't all have to be misanthropic. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to go and have a cry. <laughs> if you enjoyed the podcast, <laughs> check back for next month where we've got... Who have we got on the podcast next month, Lex? So in March, we're going to be interviewing the wonderful Melanie Joy. So that is one to tune into, look out for. It's been an absolute pleasure to have Moby on this one. I really, really enjoyed the interview. So great job, Faye. And we'll see you all next time. Mm-hmm.